Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our February Grand Rounds. I'm Howard Chansky. I'm the chair of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and this is our February 2023 Grand Rounds. And I am looking forward to hearing Dr. Max Cole, one of our R4 residents, and Dr. Bert Yaze, the chief of our Division of Pediatric Orthopedics at Seattle Children's, and also a pediatric spine surgeon, talk about um, leadership and building effective teams. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me just fine? My name is Max, I'm one of the R4s, as uh, Dr. Shansky said, and we'll be chatting today briefly about leadership and build, building strong teams. And then uh, Dr. Yase will come in and, and grant us his wisdom. So first, briefly, we'll chat about kind of what is a team, we'll try to put some definitions on what team performance is, how do we study teams, why do they matter, are they worth it? And then we'll talk specifically about the composition of an OR team, the benefits of why strong leadership matters, and then you know, can leadership be taught or is it this, this innate thing that uh, you know, is really ne nebulous? So first off, why is uh, a resident giving this topic? You know, what right do I have to give the intro on a leadership lecture to physicians who are my leaders? Uh, I'm still a learner. I'm not even an attending yet. So however, most of us have been on some sort of team in the past, whether that's been a sports team or during residency, and all of us have had leaders, either good leaders or others not so good. But before doing this talk, I always thought that leaders were kind of born, not made. I always thought that what considered to be a good leader was aligned strictly with their intrinsic abilities, uh, whether it was their personality or their ability to bring people together. Um, I thought leaders just were kind of born. And then I realized that in comparison to the focused emphasis that we have in residency on hard skills as an orthopedic surgeon, a lot of the softer skills, a lot of the leadership skills that are necessary to being a well-rounded surgeon in the 21st century are typically only learned by observation of our attendings. There's no formal curriculum for it. And with that observation, I decided to take a particular interest in learning about leadership and team dynamics now as a resident, so that when I'm put into a position of leadership as an attending, I can try to fulfill that role to the best of my ability. Some portion of this grand rounds may seem obvious, like a no brainer for some of you, and that's a really good thing. Um, but it's important that we highlight some of the recent research surrounding teamwork and leadership that attempts to identify and quantify what is otherwise a fairly nebulous topic. So first off, also, I'm not alone in my budding interest in team training. This is just a simple PubMed search of the past 23 years that had something like team training or teamwork training or crew resource management in the title. And in the year 2000, there were 16 studies published. And in the year 2021, there was 243 studies published. So it's drastically on the rise. We'll start off with some definitions. What's a team? A team is a social work unit consisting of two or more people with social interactions, meaningful interdependencies, shared values and goals, a discrete lifespan, different expertises, and then clearly assigned roles and responsibilities. And then it's really important to define the difference between teamwork and task work and how those relate to team performance. So teamwork is essentially how the team does something. It's the interactions amongst all the team members. Whereas task work is what each individual is doing within the team. Those aren't related to one another. It's essentially what a team is doing. But putting those together is how you would define team performance. It's what the you know, finished product on paper is, so to speak. It's what the actual team does. So diving into the business literature and psychology literature was certainly different than our typical orthopedic literature. But there's good frameworks out there. And this is one I liked in particular where team performance is described in terms of inputs, mediators, and outcomes. Outcomes are things like quality of care or errors, and they're influenced by mediators, which are essentially teamwork and leadership. And then these processes are further influenced by inputs, which are things like the team member's experience, the task complexity, time pressure, et cetera. This framework helps emphasize the critical role that team processes are um, and how they're the mechanism by which team members resolve team demands and get over problems. The literature also usually tends to differentiate between process-related and outcome-related performance. So process-related performance measures are 
things like the behavior of a team during a procedure. It makes it fairly easy to assess because it's just watching if the team can adhere to the protocols that are put in place or not. On the other hand, outcome related performance, which usually is what we tend to, to like, are tricky. These are things like measuring morbidity and mortality or infection rate after a surgery, et cetera. And these are really fraught with confounding variables. And it's really tricky sometimes to identify if the team's actions themselves were related to the performance outcome. However, it's probably the most important thing because you want to know actually how the patient does. So somehow Star Trek always seems to get it right. Now, this is one of my favorite quotes. So it's impossible to commit no errors and still lose. That's not weakness, that's life. Actually, that's medicine. But this is the, highlights the difference between the two types of research in teams. So outcome-driven research is something where if you're looking, for instance, at a cardiac arrest patient, you can do every single thing right. You can commit no errors. You can have a perfect process performance and the patient can still die, and you can have a very low outcome performance. So it's very important that when we're looking at studies, we actually look at what the performance measure is measuring, because in our world, sometimes we don't necessarily care if the process is really, really well, if the outcome is poor. So how do we study teams? It's largely, most of the studies are observational. It's judged by an expert. And it's really hard to apply traditional medical research principles like randomized controlled trials, et cetera, uh, simply by the nature of the human dynamics. So why do good teams matter? This is a really interesting study that I found that had 90 hours of observation during 48 different surgical procedures over you know, close to 100 different team members in the surgery. And of the 421 communication exchanges between the team members that were recorded during these hours of observation, almost one third of them were considered failures. That failure was either occasion where the timing was poor, content where information that was necessary was actually missing or inaccurate, a purpose where issues were not resolved and the statement kind of drifted off into the ether, or the audience where somebody was trying to speak to somebody who wasn't even there and it, you know, key individuals excluded. And of those 129, one third of all of them jeopardize patient safety in some way. So they either led to an increased cognitive load, they interrupted the routine of the OR, or they increased the tension in the OR. So essentially teams matter because patients matter. And our team is worth it. So another study in the psychology literature, there was 129 studies as a meta-analysis of healthcare settings that looked specifically at team training. And it showed that certainly when you actually trained teams to be teamwork oriented, they had a better job performance, decreased medical errors, and improved safety climate, and reduced patient mortality. And when explicitly taught, teamwork training was found to have a really a small but significant effect size on both process and outcome performance-driven measures. So this paper worked to highlight the effectiveness of team trainings under a variety of conditions because the effect size was roughly the same, uh, irrespective of either the team composition, whether they used a high fidelity or low fidelity simulator for their teamwork training or the acuity of the trainee's unit. Whether the patient came from the, I, or the team came from the ICU or the emergency room or an outpatient setting, it didn't matter. And then one more meta-analysis looking at 138 different psychology studies from multiple different industries showed that task interdependence was uh, most directly related to the relationship between teamwork and performance. Specifically, relationships tended to be stronger when teams had higher levels of task interdependence and when teams tended to be large, which is essentially like an orthopedic surgery team. So in a nutshell, are teams worth it? You know, yeah, stronger teamwork and higher task interdependence equals a stronger end performance. And there's no other place in the country or in the workplace that I know that has a higher task interdependence than our job as orthopedic surgeons. So the bottom line, are teams worth it? Yep, certainly are, I think so at least. Specific teamwork-based training leads to improved performance in both process and outcome-related studies. And the more interdependent the team task, which is what we do every day, the bigger the effect that teamwork has on the performance. So now we'll talk a little bit about teams and specifically we'll talk about an OR team. Um, you know, at some level of abstraction, each surgical process, procedure follows a prescribed process. 
At that same level of abstraction, the roles of the critical team members are fairly well defined and understood. But in the OR day to day, as we all know, this you know, level of predictability is less certain. Every patient's unique. Uh, it may require on the spot adaptations in technique, process, procedures, et cetera. Team members change from time to time. Many don't work consistently with one another. And all of this changes the dynamic of the situation, the skills that are required, the skills that are available in the OR, and then the adaptive capacities of the, of the team to change. So I found this drawing, which I love. Uh, from 1793, the patient looks really, really happy to have his uh, leg amputated. But here we have the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, the circulating nurse, the scrub tech, the assistant, and the medical student. So there's a really good study in 2011 by Leach et al. that actually showed that surgical team members have different views about each other's role in the team. Interestingly, surgeons viewed themselves as, you know, their key role is managing the team and managing the case, while the other members of an operating room team thought that preparation was the most important uh, role for the surgeon. Circulating nurses reported technical competence as their own key action, whereas other team members identified that managing the case was the circulating nurse's key role. Scrub techs thought that their key role was preparation of, for the case, while everybody else thought it was technical competence. And then finally, everyone agreed that the anesthesiologist needs to be technically competent for their case. These disparities in this study show that there are potential challenges for a surgical team. These differing views may be a source of conflict or tension, especially in an emergent or urgent situation where the team roles are expected to be defined, but actually everyone views them as differently. So in spite of differing perspectives, leadership behaviors that set the tone for team interactions and create an environment of respect and understanding are really influential in promoting effective team performance. So in this study in particular, it was the surgeon and the circulating nurse that were seen as those leaders when uh, things got tough that people looked to. So this title may seem a little obvious that leadership is beneficial, but I want to give a concrete example. So leadership obviously creates and sustains culture changes that are necessary for the adoption of team improvement tools and strategies. In particular, implementation of surgical briefings and debriefings that allow teams to ensure all members understand the goals, roles, and responsibilities, and have a chance to voice concerns and discuss the team's performance have been implemented across the country. These briefings have shown to statistically reduce sentinel events in wrong-sided surgeries, and they've been widely implemented in surgery, but surgical teams with leadership involvement and visible support for these are more likely to sustain the practice over time. Across organizations, the amount of improvement in patient outcomes realized by the introduction of structured communication tools is okay, significantly really moderated by the pre-existing culture of the organization. So cultures that are high in safety culture, these debriefings help a tremendous amount. While, uh, whereas those organizations that are relatively low in safety culture tend to view these surgical debriefings as a you know, administrative task of little value. The buy-in of leadership to safety measures makes it safer. So historically, orthopedic surgeons functioned as the unchallenged authority in the operating room there's a highly individualized surgical workflow and a very surgeon-centric OR that has now been demonstrated to be less reliable and less safe for the patient. And so diving into this, the psychology literature suggests that an effective leadership, uh, effective leadership can actually be taught regardless of personality traits. So for instance, when leader behaviors, which are things like management approaches or promoting the empowerment and development of the team, are compared with leader traits, which are things like intelligence or extroversion, the behaviors have a greater overall impact on leadership and team effectiveness than just the traits of the leader itself. So this is important because it shows that effective leadership can be developed and implemented regardless of individual traits. And it's achievable for all orthopedic surgeons, regardless of background or intrinsic personality. A useful framework to characterize successful orthopedic surgeon leadership is the concept of level five leadership. This was created in 2001 by a business consultant, Jim Collins, 
and Dr. Yase will actually touch on this a little bit later as well, but the hierarchy runs from level one leaders, which are defined as highly capable individuals who make productive, meaningful contributions to the group, all the way through level five leaders who are defined as those who build enduring greatness of the team or organization. Collins describes level five leaders as the, which is the level that we should all strive for, um, as leaders exercising this difficult duality of both being humble and willful, they're reserved and fearless. They both take responsibility and know when to ask for help. They lead with passion, but also demonstrate humility. And while most orthopedic surgeons find it easy to function as a level two leader, where they, you can be highly proficient and competent and contribute to the team, attaining higher levels of leadership involves the effective management of people. And that's much more difficult. And it's the focus on developing one's own emotional intelligence that facilitates effective teamwork that's the most effective behavior to rise to higher levels of leadership. And finally, while many studies have attempted to define effective leadership, it's also been recognized that effective leadership is not a one size fits all, and it's really highly dependent on context. Effective leadership requires different approaches based on the situation and setting. And so it's imperative that orthopedic surgeons know when and how to adapt their actions based off of the scenario. So this is a particularly helpful framework as well. This is called Goldman's Six Leadership Styles. It was highlighted in the Harvard Business Review in the year 2000. And it labeled six different leadership styles, which were commanding, visionary, affiliative, democratic, case setting, and coaching. And there's an emphasis that one certain style is good for one certain particular situation, whereas it might actually be harmful in another. So for instance, in a crisis setting, a democratic style may be detrimental to the outcome of the desired, uh, the outcome of the team, where a commanding style may be more suited. And similarly, when setting off on a new venture as a team, adopting a visionary outlook with a clear direction for change might be better functionally for the team than a commanding style. And so this framework highlights the importance that learning how to master the flexibility to recognize and apply different types of leadership in a wide variety of situations is in and of itself an incredibly important skill to develop for any leader. And so if we go back to the outline from the very beginning of our talk, what is a team? You know, we discussed process versus outcome performance and understanding that in the literature, those are different and trying to identify which one is being assessed is very important. And that usually these are all studied by observational means. And good teams matter because the patients matter. And if you have good teams, you tend to have fewer m, &M chances. And yes, teams are worth it for the same exact reason. We talked about the OR team and then that the benefits of strong leadership equals sustained safety for our patients. And that's clearly the number one priority for us. And then finally, yeah, leadership can be taught. It can be taught to anybody regardless of background. And so as I wrap up my portion of the talk, I think it's important to remember that you know, the discussion of teams and leadership is incredibly complex. There's endless opportunities for discussion as I've had with multiple attendings over the past couple of months. Um, this is just one small segment in the overall field and it's impossible to do justice uh, with one just single morning lecture. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Yase for a, a deeper dive and how the benefit of teams and power of effective leadership has directly affected his life and how it can affect all of us in the real world. Thanks, Max. Uh, that was great. Um, it's really nice to see something that started out as a conversation during Journal Club last year uh, and uh, develop it into a grand rounds. Um, everybody can hear me okay? Or, uh, so these are my disclosures, nothing that pertains to this, except that uh, some of those uh, disclosures involve uh, team building activities. Um, I think it's important to start when talking about teams and leadership to understand your audience. And so who are the uh, who are the experts? Um, because as I've kind of coached residents and mentored residents into giving grand rounds, I always told them to, you know, study to be the expert uh, for the content that's been delivered. And I would have recognized that there we have lots of leaders and experts on this call who probably have more experience even than myself. I think that leadership and team building can also be controversial after I've given uh, some of this talk in other places. It continues to evolve, and that's because there are different types of 
leadership styles, as Max already mentioned. There's also been a generational evolution and what leadership looked like in the 70s and 80s and 90s is evolving um, into uh, current modern times. There's also been an evolution of goals. So even if we look at OR teams, uh, and that may be efficiency, which leads, can lead to financial uh, incentives, but also social goals and the interactions or patient safety or uh, patient reported outcomes and so forth. And then Max already touched on the, you know, some people think that uh, leadership and uh, is innate and is born with born to be a leader versus the opportunity to learn, which is what I think is. So let's, if we look at just a couple different definitions of leadership, um, these are two important ones that are both meaningful and relevant for us as orthopedic surgeons. And that's the, especially in developing of OR teams. And first is transactional leadership. And this is the, probably the most uh, common form that we think of it. It's basically, every, if you look in the operating room, everybody has a purpose based on a skill set that they learned they went to school for. And the transactional leadership is where you create an environment where you try to have the individual teams perform their job that they were trained to do to the best of their ability and essentially maximize the performance and outcome associated with those abilities. Transformational leadership is a leader who works with teams and followers beyond their immediate self-interest. And essentially what they do is they inspire their team members to perform above their learned behaviors or their specific skill sets. Um, and it's thought that this actually transforms the team and ultimately leads to higher performance. And we'll delve a little bit more into that um, in some later slides. I think the, the important thing to recognize is as a leader or as a surgeon, we're all leaders. And uh, a lot of People, the moment you step onto the floor in the operating room, even as a resident, uh, there are people who think of you as a leader. And there's, you can go through an entire organization as a surgeon and be a leader all the way up until a political organization. There have been orthopedic surgeons that have served on the US Senate. So in team building, there are uh, lots of different challenges, but I, I'm going to focus on just two. And probably the first challenge is intrinsic to all of us is that recognizing our individual roles in as being a leader in this team building process. And we're going to focus on OR teams, but there are a lot of different teams that we're involved in our ambulatory care teams, uh, teams within the division or the department. And even if you go into private practice, uh, it'll be important to build your team for both uh, optimal performance of the front and back office. So it's it's really critical for us to recognize our roles. But you can't come just as a leader and expect to build a team. There are other challenges, and specifically in the OR, and I think we we all will recognize and encounter this in our daily uh, experiences at UW or Seattle Children's. We're a part of a big training center that has a lot of rotating personnel and students and so forth. Uh, this has acutely become an issue with staffing shortages and turnovers in the past year or two. The other interesting thing about OR teams is that administrators don't always necessarily like dedicated OR teams. And that's because these employees gain specialized skills. And typically, these employees are more expensive once you become specialized. The other thing administrators worry about is that employees can become too loyal to the team, and they may actually have greater loyalty to the, to the team than the institution itself. And that's because these teams can be fun or easier, finish earlier. And once people become specialized, managers are concerned about losing the flexibility of these team or these employees being able to cross cover other teams. So Max done a really good job, you know, you know, how do OR teams enhance performance? And so there's a, there's a lot of literature and I'm not necessarily don't want to be too repetitive. What I really want to focus on is some of the literature that uh, I've used and that has existed in, in my world with regards to the development of spine teams and two specific studies that I've actually utilized um, uh, frequently with dealing with administrators, because again, uh, we all think about team performance and we all acknowledge that teams want to win and be successful, but really administrators like data and we want their data to support what their, what their goals are. So this study by Jack Flynn, uh, the chief at CHOP, he uh, looked at his development of a pediatric spine team. And, and when he looked at the patients that were, and categorized them based on complexity, he found that across the board, irrespective of the level of cases, 
um, when you had a dedicated spine team, the cases were more efficient. And efficiency relates specifically to value in terms of financial value. You know, you can do, if you can get through a case faster, you can do more cases, um, or you don't need to keep people over time and so forth. And what was interesting is we think of it from a spine perspective as complexity and the advantages of, of you know, complex spine teams. It actually had the biggest benefit in the easiest cases. This study by Feroz Mianji, who's just across uh, the border in Vancouver, brought it to British Columbia. Um, he looked at it, uh, his development of a pediatric spine team, and uh, didn't look at it from a financial perspective necessarily, but looked at it from a basically a quality and safety uh, point of view. And so with the development of his pediatric spine team, he found a significant decline in uh, surgical site infections, obviously OR time, length of stays, but even found a, almost a nearly 50% decrease in unplanned reoperations. Um, and so, you know, again, there's data, at least in my world, but I assume in everybody else's world, that shows that uh, the development of these OR teams uh, hits many goals, patient safety, patient quality of care, as well as financial so that's really addressing number two, and really uh, challenge number two is just involves data. The rest of this talk is really going to focus more on challenge one and recognizing our roles um, as surgeons in team development. Um, and, and again, there's lots of different le leadership styles. Uh, you can even get actual assessments of your leadership uh, styles. These can be found online or through various programs. Uh, but with this and this awareness of your leadership style also comes uh, realization of where your deficits may be and ultimately on learning how to uh, overcome some of those to become a better leader. I think it's important to recognize as surgeons, especially residency, as we go through this process of becoming a surgeon, um, we all work on teams. But our, our process of becoming a, a surgeon, a great surgeon, it really is being driven by individual goals. So even though we're part of a team, our pathway has been very individualized. We've been focused on match day, getting the best residency or the best fellowship or ultimately the best job. And these defined milestones are very individualized in what, would we would, what I would consider one of the most competitive both industries and specialties. But in order to really kind of develop really high performance teams, we need to start thinking a little bit broader, right? So when we look at our individual goals, we can be on a team, but our team, we have individual trophies, and that's more like a track team. And we want to switch our mentality in terms of in the OR, for example, with developing teams. We want to have much more of a team goal oriented. So everybody wants to get done early. Everybody wants to have patient have great outcomes. So how to do this? Well, there's lots of different ways and I'll present a couple different uh, ideas, but you know, first you have to create an environment that enables that team mentality. And so this is a model that's been well studied and well represented among um, various different leadership programs. And this is the idea of this pyramid is starting at the bottom and moving up. And so essentially you need to create a team that trusts each other, right? So with trust uh, comes a sense of vulnerability, but it also then allows for conflict. So you need to be able within a team to have uh, constructive uh, criticism and dialogue um, to elevate the best idea. And once people are feeling comfortable and elevate the best idea, they'll be committed to that idea for that team. And people who are committed will hold each other accountable ultimately to get the best results. This model here is looking at really how, how teams work together. And this is something that uh, Google uh, has utilized and other, um, other uh, more modern uh, kind of companies have, have used. And it supports this idea, which has been found in lots of different studies that what really matters is less about who is on the team, but more about how the team works together. And, and these are the tools that drive ultimately the impact of that team. Similar to the previous slide, psychological safety is important. So team members need to feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. Teams need to be, team members need to be dependable. So we want patient, we want everybody to be on time so that the case starts on time, right? And that's 
relevant to the anesthesiologist. That's relevant to the surgeon, uh, uh, you know, getting to the OR on time. So if we're late to sign our consent or late to start our case, we're not essentially being an effective team member. Um, everybody has their role. And so those roles are important. There's a certain goal associated with that role. But even beyond that, work needs to be personally important to the team members. So it's not just necessarily about the skill set and using the skill set, but people want to have meaning in their work and being on a team. And they ultimately, what they'd like to see is that their work matters and it creates change. Now, I think uh, most of us in orthopedics have had some involvement with sports. Um, and so there's a lot of sports studies uh, looking at teams. Probably the most important one, and this one I didn't actually know, is the study of the uh, All Blacks team, um, which is a rugby team out of New Zealand. Actually, most studies consider, irrespective of who your favorite team is, most con studies consider this to be the best and most successful team in all professional sports in modern day. And when they looked and studied, uh, you know, the various different uh, characteristics of the team, they found that character of both the team members and the leader were important. So there was, you, one was never too big to do the small things when something needed to be done. Everybody was in the team was willing to adapt, and this the adaption created a competitive advantage. Everybody wanted purpose or meaning to the actions that they were doing, and this does create a, a sense of direction for the team. Uh, everybody wants to have some sense of responsibility or accountability, and this is created by the leaders really passing this responsibility and creating ownership and delegating, uh, which then lends itself to trust in the environment and the success of the teams. And then you need to create a learning environment, right? They're going to always be new members to the team and leaders, as well as really all the team members need to be able to teach that. Now, six is probably the hardest and I'm not necessarily sure that is attainable in an OR team, but it would be great. And I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing this one now. Um, and that's the idea that once you're a team, especially in the All Blacks, you are a team 24-7. So it's this idea that these teams become an extended family. You already saw this from, uh, from Max and this idea, idea of being a level, level five uh, executive uh, leader. And, and the idea is that you become, uh, you know, so humble in this experience that the success of the team is greater than the success of the leader. And it becomes so important that the leader of that team actually focuses on even the success of the uh, subsequent leaders on the team. So, you know, if we look a little bit about uh, just some of the skill sets that are needed uh, for leadership and that we can ultimately learn, Max already talked a little bit about hard skills and we'll talk a little bit about soft skills. I think residency and medical education does this really well. So um, the hard skills of being a surgeon and being a leader are, we think about it, we learn about diagnoses and treatment plans. Our surgical technique is a hard skill. It requires repetition. Um, complication management and crises and, uh, you know, complications in the OR uh, are hard skills that we learn. Time management, clearly, in order to be effective as, a, as an orthopedic surgeon, we need to know how to manage our time or build organizations. Um, and billing and coding is a hard skill. And all of these lend themselves to this transactional leadership that I defined early. Um, and these and those are skills that are actively taught and actively learned um, by uh, uh, or very effectively in residency. Soft skills, on the other hand, are probably skills that are more passively learned. It's almost like uh, bedside manners, right? Medical school tries to, uh, you know, teach bedside manners, but it becomes a little bit more fluid and a little bit harder to teach. And leadership soft skills are self-awareness, or uh, Max talked about emotional intelligence, which is basically uh, awareness of the environment that you're in and an understanding of the various emotions and experiences of the people that are on your team. Having empathy for your team members, um, being creative, being able to adapt, and, and as Max suggested, uh, communication. And it's actually these soft skills that have been more associated with uh, transformational uh, leadership. 
Now, if we look at you know the importance of soft skills, and I and I mentioned earlier that there's been this kind of evolution in um, kind of what leadership looks like. Uh, the Harvest Business Review recently uh, looked at this and found when they studied you know C-suite hires or essentially uh, CEO, CFOs, and so forth. They found that there's been a greater prioritization on social skills. So transactional leadership was was the main form of leadership in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and so forth. But there's been greater movement towards uh, these development and looking at soft skills um, for C-suite execs. And the main, uh, you know, at least for this article, drivers for that is that. Um, you know, companies are becoming more diverse, they're becoming more uh, uh, complex, especially uh, across, uh, you know, different international footprints and so forth. The other thing is that with information technology, there's a speed of communication and transparency, and um, I'm going blank on the, uh, on the specific company, but last year, it was all over print about a CEO who laid off or fired, um, you know, a, a good percentage of his employees uh by email and so you know people that was immediately noted by everybody and because of information technology um that person actually ended up stepping down from his leadership role because he didn't quite have the eq to know that that wasn't necessarily going to be the best way and then obviously diversity and inclusion um relies heavily on some of these soft skills how do these different leadership styles affect the operating room? Well, this study out of uh, Journal American College of Surgeons um, a couple of years ago looked at this and they looked only at cases that were considered high risk. So cases that had a greater than 20% complication risk. Then they assessed uh, each of the attending surgeons on their various leadership characteristics and defined them as transactional, transformational. And then there's also passive leadership. And then looked at the outcomes. Um, including kind of team behavior responses. What's interesting is that there was really a very narrow margin for all of the surgeons on their transactional leadership scores. So we, you know, our abilities to uh, be a transactional leadership was very well taught. What was different among the attending surgeons was their transformational leadership scores. And what was found that an increase in one point of a transformational leadership score allowed for the teams to be more effective in communicating. Um, there were greater positive team behaviors and less negative team behaviors. And ultimately, this affected the performance of the team. So it's not that one is better than necessarily the other. It's the reality is that an optimal team performance needs to bridge both of these skills. Uh, and to be an effective te team leader, you need to know when it's good to use your soft skills to build a team. But it's equally important to have uh, a dependency on hard skills. You know, uh, you uh, have a major complication in the operating room. It isn't necessarily the time to, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you know, what your life was like or what your day like was yesterday or the emotional state of everybody in the room. It's kind of that command authority. And based on experiences of previous, um, you know, previous complications, um, you, need to, you need to follow on what you learned and your specific job. So how do you do this? How do you learn a lot of these? First is through mentorship. Uh, and I know that uh, we're moving ahead with mentorship in our within our own department. Um, and so, you know, I think everybody should, you know, who are our mentors and what uh, learning can we get both actively and passively from our mentors? I think it's also equally important to being a mentor. And that includes for the residents themselves being mentors for kind of the more junior uh, residents, because like teaching, it's a two way process. You actually learn from teaching and so uh, being a mentor requires a, you know to be an effective mentor the utilization of soft skills this is something i kind of learned later in my professional life is you can actually hire coaches to help you with your uh, leadership skill sets uh, and a coach is a, a hired professional um, who serves as a great sounding board so you're paying these people typically you don't pay mentors they have developed their soft skills and EQ. They have essentially fundamental experience. And usually they teach from real world experience. 
Um, it is a confidential space. Um, and for that, um, there's usually greater dialogue that can happen. But similarly, they can also set goals and hold you accountable. I think we also have to acknowledge that there's a lot of value in the people that we put that we surround ourselves with as well, family, friends, and colleagues, right? These are contemporary of yours. And so they will have greater insight to your personal attributes and will likely call you on some of your, uh, you know, some of your weaknesses more than uh, either mentors or coaches will sometimes. And then finally, you know, it is good to get exposed to leadership programs. This is something that uh, you may or may not know exists. There are institutional leadership programs, societal institution uh, leadership programs. The AOA is dedicated to teaching future leaders. And beyond that, you can go to programs that are outside and spread across different industries, uh, such as, that's available through the Harvard Business School. And if you have the time and money, you can get uh, additional degrees. And then finally, you know, personal reading. And so there's lots of books on leadership and similar to our journal articles, um, you can read the Harvard Business Review. And so uh, as, you know, while it's very important to continue to read on orthopedics and learn and learn the new, the newest and latest, grit, the, you know, skill sets and further develop our transactional skills or our hard skills, um, I think it's, uh, you know, finding time to also develop some of these soft, soft skills will be important. Ultimately, what I like to, to end on is really an example of what I think has uh, been a very instructional uh, experience for me and really what I think is the ultimate team. Um, and so I've been doing medical submissions for uh, about uh, 10 years now, and I've been a uh, leading a medical spine mission for the past five through uh, global spine outreach. And so this is a team of all volunteers uh, where you have lead surgeons, lead administrators, you have uh, surgeons uh, who are volunteering their time and flying in from uh, US and uh, working with local surgeons, different neuro monitoring specialists and various different volunteers. And what's important to know is that all of these volunteers have typically not ever worked together. So you're bringing in new people to, uh, to this environment. And then over the course of one week, uh, basically in this environment, I, can, uh, I have been able to accomplish 15 complex uh, pediatric spine surgery and two ORs. I can tell you that I've not worked in any institution in the US where I've been able to effectively do this. And while this team experience is for a week and it's on steroids, it is an example of how a really an ultimate team with good both transactional as well as transformational skill sets can really uh, effectively, uh, you know, uh, do great, you know, patient care. So I'd like to just end and hopefully just kind of uh, allow for some questions or discussions. And once again, really thank Max for, uh, you know, uh, creating this uh, grand rounds. Anyone can either raise their virtual hand or put a question into the chat box or just speak up. I'll give people- This is Jen Bauer, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, thanks guys for your talk. Bert, you mentioned a number of things that you've been involved in to help uh, teach you the uh, leadership. What do you think is this has been the single most important one of those or, or most useful one? Uh, yeah, no, great question. I think, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it's the, the job that I sit in right now. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, you are, you know, as all of us are driven to be successful in the things that we do and, and hold ourselves accountable to it. So, um, you know, it, it's hard to say exactly. I mean, I've done the advisory board through, my work at uh, San Diego and had exposure there. And um, I think the personal readings are continuously stimulating, um, having conversations with a lot of individuals. So it's hard to say that there's one specific one that's probably the best, but I do think that uh, learning through experience has is, is probably been the most um, fruitful or if, if I could say that. 
I would add to that list, the American College of Surgeons actually puts on a really nice um, leadership program. It's a brief one. It's not too expensive. The nice thing is you're you're interacting with colleagues who typically you would not know. So it's a, a different environment and, and uh, perhaps easier to sort of speak about complex issues that you're dealing with and would like some help with. Um, that, that was a great talk. I, I don't have a question. It's more of a comment. And I, I think, you know, to your credit, you you chose maybe the toughest problem for us to focus on, which is developing teams in the operating room. And, you know, I it we had those teams, you know, for example, at UW Medical Center, it was all teams you had consistent anesthesiologists, consistent scrubs, um, consistent circulators. And we, we do to a degree, but we really lost that pre-pandemic. Um, and and the I would say it was both administration and uh, unfortunately our anesthesiologists who, um, you know, did basically did away with that by, you know, saying they were unable to staff us with that kind of consistency. So it's a it's a really challenging problem that we we probably need all our skills to address starting at the very top of our medical centers um, to get back to that kind of consistency because we all know what you presented data for that in terms of you know operational and fish efficiency, patient care, um, morale. Uh, there's no doubt that consistent teams is critical for all of that. I don't know if you have any comments, Bert. I know you've been working. I know ev all of us probably have been yeah. working to get back to that point. Yeah. And I, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, what's interesting is, and this, you know, was started even before my arrival here, um, you know, uh, going through a very similar thing. It's interesting enough is that uh, pediatric spine, it's the only uh, subspecialty team that exists at Seattle Children's, meaning that there's teams for orthopedics, teams for neurosurgery, teams for general surgery, but uh, pediatric spine is the only subspecialty team actually within the ORs right now. So, and, and that was created, you know, during the environment, you know, and so I think there, you know, it does require a lot of data. And then it requires a lot of buy-in. And then, it, you know, the other probably important part of that is, is knowing that even once you create that, there is a responsibility to maintaining it too. So that it, it, even once you have the team, it requires a lot of work to maintain it with the administration improving with data. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it goes back to what you had said. Much of it just comes down to, you know, practical issues. You know, I think our anesthesiologists would like to have consistent teams know who they're going to be working with every week but you know at some point um, they decided they just didn't have the people power to be able to do that anymore and i think for the administrators it's like you said without the data i, I don't know that they quite get how important it is And any questions? That was a that was a great talk. And Max, I really appreciate it. You put a lot of effort in, and and you guys essentially split the talk into two. And we've had many residents um, going back to Max Max's opening lines. Um, you know, we've had many residents who have served uh, important leadership roles while they were here, and we have some now. And residents in those roles have made big contributions, both to ind individual faculty. Um, to the department, to the care of our patients. Um, so um, I know I know you weren't really um, short selling yourself, uh, but I think you have those leadership skills as do many of our residents. So so uh, and and of course, Bert, Dr. Yaze um, has has really done an incredible job in the relatively short time he's been here and um, he wasn't going to talk too much about himself, but um, it, it's been great to have Dr. Yaze here and look forward to seeing more of what his uh, leadership and people skills can accomplish. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. I hope everybody has a great day and um, talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks.